The 1970s child version of me was all about the Viper. I had this toy long before wanting anything from Star Wars. Didn't it shoot plastic missiles? The Space 1999 Eagle never made my Christmas miss, but the television show was an intermittent part of my living room landscape. Jump ahead to 2024, and DP has been actively preparing for the upcoming anniversary of Space 1999, which turns 50 in 2025. The first order of business this year was to produce a studio rebuild of the Eagle Transporter, the real icon of that short-lived series. In today's video, I'll take you on a condensed tour of this 14-week build project. The few 3D models I inspected were probably adequate for work in the 90s, but they're not sufficiently detailed for today's HD standards. DP's 50th anniversary studio rebuild is foremost a detailed study of the original 44-inch filming model, but it also introduces a few engineering and design upgrades that help usher the Space 1999 Eagle into the 21st century. You can read various arguments for why the Eagle should be smaller or larger than 100 feet, and the first decision I made was to lock DP's studio rebuild at precisely 30 meters. At this scale, Martin Landau, who was quite tall, would need to navigate the various doors on our ship just as he did on set in 1975. The Eagle's most distinctive feature is certainly the elaborate truss work that connects the various sections. The main truss work, sometimes called the spine, was finished first back in April. The Eagle Transporter is designed to carry different types of pods, one of which is the passenger pod. Now on kit builds, this section is often one of the easiest to assemble, but with 3D scratch building, uh, think again. There is extensive paint and parts detailing along the top, sides, and bottom. Notice that the passenger pod on the filming model even included articulated landing pads, though I don't believe the mechanical effect was ever used on the show. The passenger pod is then flanked by a mirrored pair of junction modules. Now technically it's a service module forward and an engineering module aft, but structurally these sections are duplicates, thus I had to create only one module for DP's rebuild. The Eagle's impressive detailing is on display at the rear of the ship, too. Engine bells and tanks are fairly easy to build, and they are repetitions of the same part, but it's all that curved piping that demanded the most effort here. This was the state of the model after seven weeks. The smallest section of the Eagle turns out to be the most detailed, First, there's all that painting, decaling, and etching work on the landing pod exterior, and that's only half of it. Underneath, we have a real mechanical strut assembly with several points of movement. The filming model was designed to appear as if the landing pads could retract into their respective pods, but the latter were solid blocks of wood, and so the effect was never captured on television. However, the landing pods on the anniversary rebuild do support full articulation and retraction of the Eagle's landing gear. Now, up to this point, everything has been built from scratch, zero kit bashing. It was now time to focus on the command module, and this is where I needed a bit of help. I couldn't replicate the command module's distinctive shape and contours to my own liking but I was able to make use of some geometry by Darren Lee. He did a much nicer job on the nose section than I could have done. So Darren's efforts probably saved me a couple of weeks of work and frustration. But like the rest of the ship, this section also needed to be detailed, painted, and decaled to better match the 44-inch filming model. As a hybrid effort, I think it turned out great. In the 12th week, I finally had a complete assembly of parts. It now looked like a genuine Eagle Transporter. But there was one build phase remaining, the cockpit interior, 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 interior.
we now turn our attention to the command module of the Eagle Transporter, an icon of science fiction design. But this time, you're not looking at a prop. You're about to enter a fully rebuilt interior, one designed to match the physical space inside the model down to the last inch. As we begin our tour of the reimagined Eagle cockpit, one feature becomes immediately apparent, the presence of the so-called dummy window bulkhead. Originally designed for exterior aesthetics, this lower bulkhead appears as a solid mass from the outside. But its placement imposes a critical design constraint. It consumes the space where, in the series, pilot legs were imagined to go. This rear side of the cockpit is, in many ways, more important than the dash side because of its prevalence in the show. If we want this, then no one is sitting on any floors here. The usable cabin volume begins above that bulkhead. This makes the beloved trench-style seating, as seen in the series, physically impossible without violating the outer hull. To solve this, the new interior features elevated seating, positioned just above the dummy window line, allowing realistic legroom without compromising the Eagle's exterior profile. It's a compromise, one rooted not in imagination, but in engineering. Next, we come to one of the most important challenges in this cockpit, visibility. The Eagle's forward windows, though iconic, are both narrow and set high into the outer shell. Even with elevated seating, the pilot's natural sight line offers only a limited forward view, far too narrow for real spacecraft operation. To overcome this, DP has introduced a new central instrument, the Eagle Eye Panoramic Display, situated between the primary viewports. It acts as a digital windshield, reconstructing a wide-angle field of vision, not only simulating what the pilot would expect to see through the forward windows, but also extending beyond them. The Eagle Eye can simultaneously present live feeds, port, starboard, aft, ground view, or even the passenger module interior allowing the crew to monitor passengers or cargo in transit. It's a solution that bridges form and function, preserving the aesthetic of the original design while addressing what a real pilot would actually need. At the heart of the Eagle cockpit lies a distinctive dual console stack, two independent modules designed with both legacy and innovation in mind. The upper unit, newly designated the command data link, functions as the Eagle's primary tether to Moonbase Alpha. It transmits navigation directives, telemetry, and real-time mission updates, forming a vital bridge between ship and base. While the show imagined a paper readout system, the 50th anniversary rebuild honors that idea with a more plausible twist. A digital card writer and reader, offering pilots tactile confirmation of mission-critical data, a nod to the hard copy concept, but updated for realism. Beneath it sits the Eagle Science Computer, manufactured by our fictional partner, AlphaTech, whose logo is proudly embossed on the front panel. This module expands the Eagle's mission capabilities beyond mere transport, offering a suite of scanning functions tailored for exploration, atmosphere, biology, geology, radiation, and even an enigmatic setting for alien technology. It's the 1970s version of a tricorder. The pilot and co-pilot consoles have also been re-engineered, now with distinct roles. It was often evident in the series that it didn't really matter which seat you were in. DP has designed distinct responsibilities into each crew station, an approach that reflects real-world aerospace practice. Let's break it down into shared systems, complementary controls, and seat-specific operations. Shared systems. Despite their unique roles, pilot and co-pilot share a suite of core systems. Each console retains the show's iconic video phone, now updated with its own camera and microphone. The original show relied on TV magic. Just face the nearest CRT, and somehow you're being seen and heard. Here, we've added some realism. Both consoles also include a solar visor toggle switch, which lets each crew member tint their viewport independently. Front and center 
a shared flight display, flanked by the familiar twin thrust sticks, but with a detail the original show never explored. Each stick handle features a thumb button that disengages the yoke linkage, allowing the sticks to move independently. This means the pilot can intentionally unbalance the engines, applying more thrust on one side. Remember, every Eagle engine is off-center, and that imbalance creates a steering torque. It's a crude but effective way to nudge the ship's direction, especially when full RCS control isn't needed. It adds some real-world logic to an otherwise theatrical design. Complementary controls. Each crew member controls a different interior lighting system, with the pilot commanding the overhead white flood and the co-pilot managing the ambient lights. The Eagle's propulsion system is now split by roll. The pilot's console governs the four primary aft engines, critical for forward thrust and orbital maneuvers. Meanwhile, the co-pilot manages the ventral lift engines, eight in total, vital for vertical landings and hover modes. Seat-specific operations. As command lead, the pilot station includes controls for flight mode selection, two pilots, solo or full autopilot, along with the attitude control system for pitch, yaw and roll. The Eagle Eye's second camera is also controlled from this position, essential for situational awareness. To honor the original hardware, legacy labels such as shield modulator and vacuum chamber remain, their purpose open to interpretation, but part of the Eagle's mysterious charm. The co-pilot, managing lift systems, also controls landing gear deployment and the newly introduced podlock mechanism, a hydraulic clamping system that secures the passenger module to the spine. Where once the pod seemed to magically stay put, it now rests on real-world engineering. Thus, the co-pilot station now includes dedicated podlock indicators, giving real-time status during module transitions, a change born of necessity and long overdue. And yes, the laser control remains. In a nod to series canon, the beam modulation cluster allows for selectable laser colors, preserving that signature Space 1999 energy with a new twist of logic. The settings shown here explain the cyan-tinted laser used in DP's recent animation videos. But what happens in solo pilot mode? Enter the auxiliary control interface. It's a compact panel mounted on top of the pilot console. Using a scroll and select system, the pilot can access and affect essential co-pilot functions, like raising the landing gear, triggering ascent thrust, or firing the laser, all without having to leave his or her seat. Let's now look at other additions that didn't exist in 1975, but feel right at home in this world. One of the most significant upgrades begins outside the cockpit where formerly nondescript detailing has been replaced with functional solar arrays mounted atop the Eagle's two junction modules. Inside the cockpit, this addition is reflected in the pilot's attitude control system, where a new mode switch, labeled APV for auto photovoltaic, hands over roll control to the Eagle's flight computer. When engaged, the ship adjusts its attitude to optimize solar collection maximizing energy exposure relative to the nearest star. A companion display on the upper dash shows the PV status, off, on, or auto, alongside a sun sensor and four glowing panel indicators. Brightness changes in real time based on incident photon flux. To further safeguard ship and crew, reserve battery health is shown through 12 indicators, six cells per side. Each column is labeled in the show's distinctive countdown font. Small details, but critical in an emergency. Blue means good. Red means a fault or failure. This system is linked to DP's new battery detailing on the two junction modules. There wasn't much real estate left on that part of the dash, so it made for a practical and aesthetic way to fill the space. And finally, a rethinking of the escape system. There's an episode establishing a hatch beneath the cockpit floor. A nice idea, but impractical given how difficult it would be to kneel there and how little space must remain below. So DP proposed a forward-facing emergency egress system instead. Just below the central console, there's now a storage locker, and behind it, a sealed crawlway 
that leads toward the nose of the eagle, keeping the fantasy but grounded in plausible design. These features represent more than just added detail, they reflect an evolution from television fantasy to physical plausibility. And now, after half a century, the cockpit of the Eagle Transporter finally makes sense. Happy 50th anniversary to Space 1999. I think they can work. Last year, the seat design was very different. They were still elevated and motorized, but far more compact. The idea was to use motorized leg lifts to help the pilots ease into the legroom cavities. But this year, I began questioning if those seats were unnecessarily too different from the show. This design is more consistent with the original seats, and I did pay attention to clearance when developing the new consoles. These seats have exactly the same range of motion as my earlier build, but they do require the pilots to set down and swing their legs into place. The stowable RCS control was an important 11th hour addition. Brian Johnson's thruster detailing went largely ignored in the show because they weren't piped into the filming model's Freon canisters. So Keith Wilson didn't really have reason to include some kind of NASA joystick. But I felt it was a cockpit detail that finally needed to make an appearance. They came to America to get to us get to go get. over to do a project called Space 1999. Right. Very exciting project in terms of concept. It had to do with a base a moon base alpha people who were based on the moon right uh, and because of loading up the far side of the moon with nuclear waste it explodes and we're thrust out it with no orbit in this kind of self-contained unit looking for a place to continue our lives maybe because we keep running into hostile things 